Hi everyone. Hi. Thank you very much um, for joining us and coming to this evening's talk as part of the Bristol Britain and Beyond Festival run by Epigram, the University of Bristol's student newspaper. Um, I'm Georgie, deputy editor at the newspaper and I'm in my third year studying psychology at Bristol University. And so it happens to be that tonight's speaker actually runs one of my units um, and that is Stephen Lewandowski. Uh, Stephen is Chair of Cognitive Psychology at the University of Bristol and his research examines people's memory, decision making and knowledge structures with a particular emphasis on how people update their memories if information they believe turns out to be false. This has led him to examine the persistence of misinformation and the spread of fake news in society, including conspiracy theories. He has published more than 220 scholarly articles, chapters and books, including numerous papers on how people respond to corrections of misinformation and what variables determine people's acceptance of scientific findings. So he is a world leading expert expert on what he'll be talking to you about tonight, disinformation, conspiracy theories and the infodemic. So please listen carefully and prepare some questions for him as there will be a short Q&A at the end. Um, so with that, I will hand you over to Stephen. Enjoy everyone. Okay, well, thank you for having me. So let me just uh, share my slides. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, I want to talk about uh, the so-called infodemic in connection with the uh, COVID pandemic. And to do that, I'll place it into uh, a fairly, you know, kind of a personal context. And um, because I've been working on this area for a number of years, but especially during the last 12 months, I've produced a whole bunch of documents that are public facing, not scientific uh, articles, but public facing documents, which I think um, can be of interest to you and which I will use to frame this talk. Um, and here they are. Those are the four public facing documents that I will present you with and give you some excerpts from what it says in there. But of course, the links are completely public and available and you can go and uh, download them. And my homepage, by the way, is at the top of the screen where you can find all my publications and handbooks and media stuff and whatever. Uh, it's, it's full of resources. Now, the broadest context for all this that I can think of is an understanding of our current technology online, our social media architecture, the way information flows online, and importantly, how that relates to democracy. And so this particular report, which is at that link, um, I was the lead author on, and we wrote that for the European Commission. It was a large interdisciplinary an international effort that wanted to, to identify the, the sort of core attributes of the online architecture and how that relates to democracy. And um, this is the sort of thumbnail summary of nearly 200 pages of, of work on that. And that is that the online economy is designed to capture and then to sell your attention. If you go on Facebook, the reason it's free for you is because you're the product. And you're the product to advertisers who are exposing you to their ads. And so the whole point of Facebook is to keep your attention on that platform for as long as possible so they can sell you more stuff. Now, they can do that. They're very clever at doing that. But retaining people's attention is completely different. It's a completely different challenge from presenting them with high quality information. In fact, it would be miraculous if an attention economy were also coincidentally gonna reward 
information of high quality. And guess what? It doesn't, which is why we have all these problems. One of the problems we're having is that, uh, you know, the internet is a fantastic place to develop, spread, and circulate conspiracy theories. And about a year ago, together with a colleague, John Cook, I produced this conspiracy theory handbook, which is not about how to design a conspiracy, but about how to meet conspiracy theories out there. It's now available in eight different languages. If you're, you know, if you speak Serbian or something, then we've got you covered at that link there. Now, here are some interesting things that came out of the research towards writing this handbook. Um, and one of the main points in there, some people, not everybody, but some people fall prey to conspiracy theories whenever they suffer a loss of control, whenever they think they're out of control. They don't know how to control their lives. Things are happening beyond their, their ability to make sense of them. Now, guess what? The pandemic is probably the best tool we have to make people feel that they've lost control. I mean, you can't even go out anymore. You can't even go to the pub anymore. I mean, Jesus, that's challenging. And so it's not surprising that events such as pandemics have given rise to conspiracy theories for centuries. I mean, since the Middle Ages, it used to be called anti-Semitism back then. Well, it still is. But now, more broadly speaking, uh, pandemics always give rise to uh, conspiracy theories. As I already said, goes back to the Black Death in the 14th century. A little more than 100 years ago in Russia, when there was a cholera epidemic, crowds blamed this on doctors and nurses, and they chased down anyone in a white coat because you know the doctors were near the patients with cholera. Well, that was enough for people to get set off and uh, go after doctors. Now, you may think, ha -ha, Russia, ha -ha, 130 years ago. Well, think again, because actually last week by now, I should have updated the slides. You may have heard that there were riots in Holland, and the rioters attacked uh, hospitals and a COVID-19 test station. And this is not unheard of in the UK either, where people are uh, standing outside hospitals chanting and shouting at doctors as they leave, accusing them of creating a hoax called COVID. And indeed, a large share, reasonably large share of the UK population endorses some sort of COVID conspiracy. That number 25% is really an upper estimate. I think it's lower than that. There are reasons why that estimate is so high, but nonetheless, we can't ignore that. Uh, we're confronted with some people who resort to conspiracies uh, in response to a pandemic. And that's not without consequences. There's other results, begin from the United Kingdom to these papers here, showing that greater endorsement of COVID-19 conspiracies is associated with less willingness to take a vaccine less adherence to social distancing and less willingness to take tests. Now, we don't know if that is a causal relationship, but we do know there is a very strong association. There's also an association, this is from earlier last year, um, between belief in this 5G conspiracy theory, this idea that 5G broadband cell phone towers are spreading this disease. There's an association between that conspiracy theory and the endorsement of violence. Uh, and unsurprisingly, um, nearly 80 5G installations were attacked in this country by arsonists and vandals, you know, knocking down something that might actually be needed to call an ambulance. It's not a non-trivial outcome of conspiracy theories. And again, we've known this for a long time. The mere exposure to conspiracies, even if you don't believe the conspiracy theories, decreases trust. It decreases 
uh, your willingness to engage in politics, to reduce your carbon footprint. Conspiracy theories can cause harm. Now, one of the reasons conspiracy theories can cause harm is because, of course, they're based on misinformation. Uh, and that misinformation spreads. And misinformation is sticky. That's one of the things that we learned, this large team of international authors that worked with me on the so-called debunking handbook. Misinformation sticks even when it is corrected in a person's head. And I'll explain in a moment why that is. The other thing that we've discovered more recently is that at the moment in some societies, the perceived authenticity of a politician may be more important than their honesty and accuracy. Let me explain both of those things in just a minute or two. Misinformation sticks. If you hear something, an outrageous claim that is completely false, such as that the Pope endorsed Donald Trump before the first time he was elected back in 2016, if you hear that, then even if you stumble across a correction a minute or two later, you may still retain that misinformation in your head. Why is that? Well, basically what happens is that if we're going, as we're going through life, you know, we're encountering information and by default, anything we read, we first think is true. That is just the way we're designed as human beings. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that anything you hear, you first think is true. That means you will use it to build a mental model, some sort of a representation of the world around you. And if then somebody says, hang on, that part of your mental model is wrong, then what do you do? I mean, if you let go of the myth, you're not a hole in your mental representation. That's very uncomfortable for people. So yes, if we correct misinformation, people will tell us, ah, you told me that's wrong when we ask them directly. But if we ask them indirectly, then they may still rely on the misinformation. And so we have this ironic or paradoxical result that is running throughout the literature and throughout political life, where people say, oh yeah, I know this is false. <laughs> and a second later, they make use of that information as though it were true. And it's not that they're being, you know, silly buggers and they're not playing games. This is deeply cognitive that if a mental model has been established, you can't just yank out a part and expect people to then walk around the world with, with that hole in their mental representation. So misinformation matters because it affects people's behavior, even if they know things to be wrong. And in the context of the pandemic, recent work, very elegant work, very sophisticated statistically, has shown that there is a causal relationship between misinformation and their behaviors. In fact, they have been able to show that certain TV programs in the United States caused more people to die because those certain TV shows um, downplayed the risk from COVID and so people didn't bother with social distancing or mask wearing, and guess what? <laughs> they uh, got infected and some of them unfortunately died. So what can we do? How, how do we deal with misinformation? Well, there's a number of things we can do. One is that we can inoculate people against misinformation. What does that mean? That means that we warn people ahead of time that they may be exposed to misinformation in the future. We explain to them how they might be misled. And if we know ahead of time how people might be misled, then we can protect the public against being misinformed. Here's one example of the study a number of years ago where that was done using conspiracy theories. That's an experiment in which people were assigned to three different conditions. In the control condition, nothing really happened. They were just asked their intention to vaccinate the children, I think. Well, I'm not sure, I can't remember. And that intention was quite high on the seven point scale. It was at 5.5, as you would expect, most people vaccinate their children. 
Now, in another condition, the uh, information was, or the question was preceded by a conspiracy theory. People were exposed to a conspiracy theory about vaccinations involving the pharma industry or government or whatever, Bill Gates, you know, there's always a candidate out there. And that significantly decreased intention to vaccinate. Now, um, if that conspiracy theory was followed by the attempt to correct it, that didn't have much of an effect. Have a look, it went up a little, but Jesus, it was still below the control condition. So being exposed to a conspiracy followed by correction didn't work too well. But here's one more condition in that experiment. That's when people were first told about the possibility that they might be misled by a conspiracy theory. Then they saw that conspiracy and guess what? Their intention to vaccinate was nearly back to that of the control condition. And that is what's meant by inoculation. You tell people ahead of time that they might be misled and then you can show that they're protected against that. So that's one thing we learned from the um, looking at the debunking literature. The other thing that I think is, is possibly less relevant in the context of the pandemic, but it's very important to understand nonetheless, is the role of authenticity. Now, these are data from the Washington Post who've cataloged more than 30,500 false or misleading statements by Donald Trump while he was president. Donald Trump has also been identified as the leading source of COVID misinformation around the world. If you look at 4 million documents containing misinformation about COVID, most of them mention Donald Trump as a source or as a contributing factor. But, hey, it made no difference until the very end, ignore what happened after the election, that's different. But throughout his presidency, his approval rating was remarkably steady. In fact, at no point in his presidency he did less than 77% of his own party approve. So producing these falsehoods had no effect. Not only did it not have an effect on his political support, on top of that, around three quarters of Republicans at various points throughout his presidency in surveys considered him to be honest. Now, what does it mean for somebody to be honest who lies 20 times a day? Well, this is where we have to understand this difference between authenticity and honesty that is very tricky and difficult to deal with, but we must understand it. And in a nutshell, what happens is this. If people question the legitimacy of a system, by that I mean a government system, an electoral system, a representational system, anything that you live in. If people question the legitimacy of the system, then a politician who pretends to be a champion of the people can signal his authenticity by violating establishment norms. And now imagine telling the truth is something that the establishment is telling people. I mean, I tell my kids not to lie. Educators tend to do that. We tell people, well, you gotta be honest. We tell people education is good. Evidence is needed for science, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all those things, when they're violated by a politician who says the opposite, then what they're doing is to signal authenticity. They're a champion of the people by lying. It's a tool to make people think this guy is on our side because he's not conforming to establishment norms. And there's a lot of politicians around the world, including in this country, who do that, in my opinion, systematically. They lie all the time. And not only <laughs> do they get away with it, on the contrary, they're, they're ahead of the polls. And I think it is because they come across as being authentic. He may be a liar, but he, he's our liar. And we can turn this on and off in experiments. I don't have time to explain all that, but that gives us another very important thing to know about when it comes to combating misinformation in society. And now finally, in the last few minutes, let me introduce you to the last handbook 
that we published in the last 12 months. That's specifically about the COVID-19 vaccine. Again, an international team. Um, and what the handbook does is to come up with the following insights. Very briefly, as I've already said, yes, there is an infodemic. But the other interesting thing that's happened, and we mustn't lose track of that, is that if you look at survey data, actually trust in scientists has been increasing since the pandemic. In the UK, two thirds of people said in May last year that they are now more likely to listen to expert advice uh, than they were previously because of the pandemic. These data are echoed in many countries around the world. Data from Germany, even the US look very similar. So yes, some people, as I've said, resort to conspiracy theories in times of uncertainty, but not everybody. In fact, here are data from just uh, two weeks ago showing that Europe is becoming more pro-vaccine. It's been a 20 percentage point increase in the United Kingdom of people who endorse uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. That's over the two months period from November through January. And that's true in other countries as well. I mean, there are some places where it's still very low, uh, at least when people talk about it. In actual fact, I think their behavior is going to be very different. But nonetheless, wherever you look, there's an increase in vaccine intention. And in the United Kingdom, it's gone up to you know, extremely high levels. So there's a striking, what I call a bifurcation in society, in many societies, including the UK. There's a vast majority of people who accept and trust science in the context of COVID, vaccines, wherever you look. And then there are some that endorse a conspiratorial alternative. And they're the ones who then, you know, in the extreme case, vandalize mobile phone installations. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, one of the reasons we have published this COVID vaccine handbook is because it is associated with an underlying wiki. And if you download the handbook, if you're interested, you'll find a lot of buttons in the PDF. And whenever you click one of those, you get taken to an underlying wiki page that has a lot of detail in it, organized, uh, a lot of additional detail. Just to illustrate, I'll tell you one thing um, that's in our wiki that is perhaps of interest to some of you. And that's the fact that a lot of the disinformation about COVID is politically motivated and in fact organized with um, well-funded think tanks. There are organizational links between people who are questioning public health measures at the moment, such as social distancing or mask wearing, and people who deny climate change. I mean, in fact, if you really wanna know, there is something called the American Institute for Economic Research. Sounds innocuous, but what it is is a front Institution, institution for political operatives that deny climate change. They say, oh yeah, well, the scientists don't agree on that. And they're also denying that COVID is, is something you got to worry about and you have to deal with it through social distancing measures. They do it using the same dodgy techniques. That's just one aspect of a lot more information on that wiki that again is kind of important to understand because if you want to deal with this, you got to you got to understand where the misinformation is coming from and why. And with that, I come to the end, just over 20 minutes. Thank you for your attention. Here are the links again, if you're interested. And I'm now happy to take questions. Hi, Stephen. Thank you very much for that. It was incredibly interesting. I think while a lot of people had heard, have heard of misinformation and term fake news most likely not many people have considered the psychology that underlies it so it's really really interesting um i have had a few questions coming through yeah. so first one is from siavash and he says why are certain groups slash demographics more likely to believe misinformation um such as for example he gave an example um bme -E people um have been shown that they will are less likely to take the vaccine. 
Uh, sorry, the the uh, what people? Oh, sorry, it says um, BME groups. Oh, BAME, B A M E. Yeah, that's very interesting. In fact, we have a page on the on the wiki <laughs> um, uh, on precisely that issue. Well, that's very interesting. Um, basically, because of um, cultural memories, and and uh, let me let me give you an example of that in the United States, not not the UK, because. I, first of all, I don't know too much about it. And secondly, because it's safely far away. Um, one of the things in, in America is that African-Americans, black people have been treated abominably by uh, the medical um, establishment and the medical profession and, and the government. Now, it wasn't too long ago that um, experiments were conducted on black people in America without their consent that led to illness and death, uh, completely unethical stuff, horrifying stuff. As recently as the sort of 1970s, uh, the Tuskegee experiment is what I'm thinking of. You may have heard of it. It's a famous case of malpractice and unethical research. Um, how long ago was that? Well, less than 50 years. Now, if you belong to an ethnic group that has been badly treated like that, and all of a sudden, somebody has this needle and says, let me stick that in you to help you. Uh, well, wait a minute, really? It's totally understandable that people uh, would be concerned about that. And to make matters worse, the discrimination continues to this date. For example, uh, black patients in, Amer in America are given less painkillers than white patients because of the uh, belief that, oh, well, you know, black people are tough. I mean, says who? It's completely racist. And yet the medical establishment to this day, I mean, you can measure this. You can just look at the number of prescriptions and the number of injections in a hospital. And what you find is that certain ethnic groups, African-Americans foremost, are given less painkillers. So against that background, is it surprising that people then say, uh, I don't trust you guys. No, I think it's precisely what you would expect. Now, that doesn't mean they're right in rejecting vaccines. And it doesn't mean that, that at the moment, you know, doctors really are trying to help everybody with, with, with a vaccine. Uh, but at least it tells you where this is coming from. And to overcome that, what we need is culturally appropriate messengers and messages people from those communities who, who take that message uh, to their own communities. And, uh, uh, and indeed, that is what, what you know, quite a few people are working on, and um, myself included. And, and that's what we have to do. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a few coming through. Um, this one is from Molly. Do you think belief in conspiracy theories will ever subside? And if so, when? Yeah, very good question. I think generally, um, the more unsettled the world is, or it's perceived to be, what matters is the perception, not what's actually happening. But, you know, if the pan if and when the pandemic is over, and, you know, things get, <laughs> maybe it's a little bit less exciting, if life is a little more normal, again, I think you will find that um, conspiracy theories are less attractive to people. And we know that from laboratory experiments. I mean, you can you can turn conspiracy theories on and off. All you got to do is get a person in the laboratory. And if I ask them to recount an episode from their lives, when they felt out of control, you know, they just tell me that. And I then give them a task where they have to express some sort of a you know, a judgment of how plausible a conspiracy theory is, that they'll find the conspiracy theory more plausible than people in the control condition who recall an episode from their lives when they were in control. And, and that's all it takes. And so um, once things return to quote unquote normal, uh, I, I would expect them to abate. Thank you very much. Um... We've got another question from Flora. What do you think the best approach is to deal with people who have already bought, bought into conspiracy theories that can be all consuming? Yes. Um, well, um, 
the answer is, first of all, it's all in the conspiracy theory handbook. Um, the, the answer is a bit nuanced because not everybody who artic articulates conspiracy theory is the same. Um, there are some people who are deeply committed to believing in conspiracy theories and for whom they have become a part of their identity. Now, those people are very difficult to reach because if you try to correct them, they will feel attacked. Um, and they're also extremely clever at escaping correction because one of the attributes of a conspiracy theory and which differentiates it from normal cognition is that contrary evidence or the absence of evidence is reinterpreted as support of the theory. So if you try to correct somebody who believes that, you know, vaccines implant microchips in their heads, if you tell them, well, actually, you know, wait, nah, that doesn't happen, then for them, the easy response is to say, see, you're part of the conspiracy. George Soros is paying you to say that. It doesn't have to be true, but, you know, it's a very easy way to dismiss contrary evidence. And that is what hardcore believers do. Or they will say, if you tell them there's no evidence for that, they'll say, see, the cover up is so good and they're trying so hard to make sure that we don't see it. That's why we know it's true. You know, I mean, <laughs> if you're in that space, there, there is no arguing out of that because that gives you license to believe anything you want. Now, the good news is <clears throat> that those hardcore conspiracy theorists are a small, small in number. Vocal, yes, but small in number. And the majority of people who make comments that sound conspiratorial are doing it mainly because it's a throwaway comment that gets them off the hook. If I want to buy myself a huge big car that eats gasoline, and then somebody walks up to me and says, what about climate change? But I really, really love my car. Well, an easy way to say is just, oh, that's a hoax. The scientists are in it for the money. And I'll walk away and buy my car. That's easy. It, it's a get out of jail for free card. And I have data showing that people do that. And those people, however, are not completely committed. They just use this as an easy way out. But if you then have a chance to talk to them, you can probably uh, achieve something with them by just talking them through the uh, evidence. So yeah. it very much depends on who you're talking to. Yeah, the example of um, Hugh Anon, if I, um, yeah. Well, uh, Hugh, An <laughs> Hugh Anon is very interesting because it's, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's basically a, a cult, really. Um, almost more than a conspiracy theory. Now, most cults have their own conspiracy theories, but in the case of Hugh Anon, it is so utterly diffuse and, um, uh, you know, so uh, broad and, and completely falsified, of course. I mean, there's nothing in QAnon that makes any sense at all. Um, yeah, I, I <laughs> it's hard to know what to, what to say about QAnon other than that it is a cult, that uh, it has become part of people's identity uh, among hardcore uh, Republicans, extreme rightists in the United States. That's just their tribal totem. And you know, they're waving the flags with a cue on it. And the moment people start doing that, then uh, talking to them about it is very difficult. And indeed, there are now support groups uh, on the internet for people, for family members and loved ones of people who've been lost to QAnon because you know, some of them end up doing nothing but surf the internet all day, getting deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole and become completely disconnected from their friends and reality. And when, when you get to that stage, it's extremely difficult to do anything about it because, uh, and when we know this from research on, on cults, on counterterrorism, you know, try, try to get an extremist, a terrorist extremist out of their uh, rabbit hole, it's not easy. 
Um, and the only way to do it is, is through a very long term, slow process you know, where you can establish a rapport and then very slowly nudge people out of their rabbit hole. But of course, most of us will never have the opportunity to do that. Um, so that can be very complicated. Yeah, in relation to that, it was um, Gruff who wants to know how people that start kind of with gateway conspiracy theories, like right. Bacon landing on the moon, on the moon um, can kind of move and get into more things like QAnon. Yeah, well, yes, um, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, first of all, there, there is evidence, strong evidence to, to suggest that anybody who believes one conspiracy theory is also very likely to believe others. Um, that's not always true, but it is statistically a, a very strong regularity, which suggests that some people just are predisposed to believe in conspiracy theories. Now, why would anybody want to do that? Well, one thing I haven't had time to mention that we also know about conspiracy theories is that they provide a sense of comfort, psychological comfort. If the world is in chaos and you can't control it, then for some people, it's much easier to blame George Soros or Bill Gates as a bad person than to accept that some random bat sneezed on a guy in a Chinese cave and now we're all in lockdown because of this new virus. I mean, that's what actually happened in all likelihood. But for most or for many people, that's kind of a tough thing to say. It's kind of like, you know, wow, that's totally beyond our control. Whereas if it was Bill Gates, then at least he has an enemy. And enemies, bad people, serve a very important psychological function. They make people feel better. Uh, some people, not everybody. I don't need enemies. <laughs> don't worry. Um, but some people do. And so conspiracy theories have that function of... of letting you imagine that the world could be a better place if it weren't for these terrible, terrible people that have created this virus. Thank you. Um, and as a last question from Sasha, do you think that people in the US are more susceptible to conspiracy theories and fake news than the UK? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I have any quantitative comparisons between countries. I mean, um, I do know that, um, well, a large share of Americans believes crazy stuff. I mean, let's be honest, right? You know, I mean, between 20 and 30% believe all sorts of things like that they've been abducted by space aliens themselves and all that. Uh, and I sometimes wonder how, you know, how many of these people were actually kidding when they said that in the survey. Um, but still, you know, undoubtedly a lot of Americans have, have uh, fairly distorted beliefs. Um, but I suspect you can probably find people with strange beliefs in, in the United Kingdom as well, especially surrounding COVID now. I mean, there are people out there who think it's a hoax. There are people out there who think it's just the flu. There are people out there who think vaccinations are there to, to control people or implant microchips in their heads. I mean, you know, there's a certain number of people like that out there, but I couldn't, I couldn't be sure like about the relative propensity of those beliefs, I don't know. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I hope thank everyone you. enjoyed that. Um, Stephen has been helping governments worldwide tackle these issues. Um, so the information you've received tonight really is coming from an expert. So thank you very much, Stephen. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah. Just so you all know, um, this has been part of a festival of talks run by Epigram and they're continuing throughout the week. Tomorrow, for example, we have Ido Vok, who's an international correspondent at the New Statesman. We have Hannah Price, a journalist from the BBC, giving a talk. Um, 
we've got the director of news at ITV, Michael Jeremy, on Thursday. And um, we've got a very exciting panel called Being English, um, where we've got a series of professors and experts running that as well. And they're all on the Epigram website if you would like to have a closer look. Well, we've also got Hamish um, Burrell, public policy co correspondent from The Economist, which should be very exciting. Um, so hopefully we'll all see you at those talks as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you again, Stephen.